picture number five. Um, and now we are finally moving past just radiation into the next component of this whole thing. And we're at, in this outline, we're at number five. Now these are complex lectures. It looks like we're half done, but we're really more like two-thirds or three-fourths done in this. But transpiration all by itself, as I said before, we talk about doing that by subtraction. Can't we just measure it directly? And the answer is yes, sort of. And that's what I want to talk about is how we can do transpiration as a direct measurement. Now, the first thing you run into when you We've simplified this thing because we've got all this other stuff feeding into this one number right here. Is latent heat and sensible heat. And you hear those terms all the time, and it's easy to get them confused. Latent heat always refers to evaporation of water for cooling, and sensible heat just means dry heat. There's no water involved. So where did we come up with these terms? I haven't studied the etiology of them, but sensible heat makes sense. Hot objects cool. They get cooler. That's easy to understand. So it's sensible. Latent heat, the object sitting there, and you shine a much brighter light on it, and the temperature doesn't change. That doesn't make sense. It can't be sensible heat. It only changes temperature after the water evaporates. The water evaporates and then it cools, so it's latent. It's, a, it's after the fact, the cooling. That helps to keep these terms because it, you get into this business and people quickly start throwing these terms around and you want to keep up with the conversation. So both of these are governed by the exact same basic principle. Um, flux is driving gradient by resistance. In the case of latent heat, the flux is transpiration, so we'll put grams of water per meter squared per second equals a dimensionless driving gradient. So dg over resistance. And the resistance is the stomates. Are they closed? Are they open? How, how open are the stomates? So it's just a ratio of these two things that de quantitatively determine transpiration. And then remember, as soon as we do weight of water through that 2.45 megajoules per liter that you're all remembering, we get milliliters of, of water per meter squared per second. Or we get joules of energy. Sensible heat, same thing, only we get joules of cooling. Now the nom denominator here is delta T. It's just simple. It's just the temperature between the two objects. And similarly, this is divided by resistance. Only over here, mostly this resistance is how fast the wind is blowing. This is a dominant factor here. This resistance is how open the stomates are to let the water vapor out. So the concepts are exactly the same. So. Now what we want to start with is this driving gradient right here. So we'll erase that. We're coming to that. Um, let me erase all of this. How do we calculate that driving gradient? If you ask most people, they would say, well, duh, how easy is that? It's relative humidity. OK. so. Most people think this is relative humidity on this. And if the relative humidity is low, stuff evaporates faster. If it's high, it evaporates slower. But it's not relative humidity. It's absolute humidity. And this gets back and forth for all kinds of gases. Absolute humidity 
is the absolute number of water vapor molecules in the air. That's pretty simple. Relative is the ratio of how much water is in the air divided by what it could hold. So if the air is hot, it can hold a lot of water vapor and the relative humidity goes down. In this room, if we had 100 water vapor molecules and the humidity was 50%, if we heated up the room, we would still have 100 water vapor molecules and the humidity might be 10% because the air could hold more water. So this distinction is critical in intuitively understanding the driving gradient for this. And the best way that I have seen to explain this is a thing called the psychrometric chart. And some of you may have seen this. Um, and I'm gonna, now, I think, maybe I don't have plenty, maybe just, just I thought I had pl plenty, you could take two of these, but um, one to write on, one to keep. If you type psychometric chart on the internet, you're going to get hundreds and hundreds of versions of this uh, chart. Um, in metric units, in old English units, um, but this is the standard chart for standard temperatures. The, the x-axis is air temperature. It goes from minus 20 to plus 50 on this chart. So we've pretty much covered the environmental range on this chart. Never mind this little subsection right here. Let's focus on this for starters. This shows five parameters of water vapor in the air and if you know any two of those five you can calculate the other three. So I can't quite write on this screen but I can draw it on here. Um, um, I'm going to simulate this and sometimes the simulation is good because it'll be more simple. Here's the basic chart. So these tick marks down here are air temperature. And almost always in practice, that's one of the things you, you know. Um, usually you don't measure water vapor to back calculate air temperature. Most of the time you know that. These curves here in the middle are relative humidity. RH all these curved lines like this. So let's take an example where we know air temperature and humidity and see what we can calculate from that. So let's say this room is 25 C and the humidity is 30 percent. Here this is Utah, it's dry air. So if we go on this chart and find 30%, here's 25C, now this, the important line is just a tiny bit past the number, it's a tiny bit bold face, and we go up, 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 until we get to 30. Right there is the point, now that, you want to draw a dot, where those humidity and temperature intersect, and I'll draw it on here. Now. If we go to the right in a straight line, let me simplify this a little, right here, and we find the tick mark on the right-hand side of the graph from this, going right straight across. Now let me see if I can do this right on the screen. 25 and 30. If I go right straight across, I'm getting 7. And I think that's pretty... 30, nope, nope, 25, 
30, I'm getting a little more than that. I'm getting seven and a half for the going right straight across. You can see what the units are of that. Absolute humidity, grams per kilogram of air. Very different unit than relative humidity. At our elevation, this is not on this chart, but at our elevation at 1500 meters, by the way, this is a chart for our elevation. This is for 1500 meters. We've made this, I've made this just for this class. One kilogram of air equals one cubic meter of air. So this is also 7.5 grams per cubic meter, but only in Logan. Sea level, this is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, this same chart is available for all different elevations and they are very similar. If I overlaid them on here, if you, if you looked at two, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. If you lay them on top of each other, you can see little differences. But the biggest difference is the density of the air. And this grams per kilogram is, is valid for all different elevations. This is the absolute humidity. How much water vapor is in the air? If we took a cubic meter of air and condensed all the water out of it, a cubic meter is pretty big, we'd only get 7.5 grams of water. That's the absolute humidity. If you look carefully over here, the second column is dew point temperature. Now, I promise five things from this. So here's one, air temperature. Two is relative humidity. Three is absolute humidity, ABS, HUM. The fourth one goes this direction, right from that point, and it's where this intersects, this curve right here, and then, and then you take that point and go down the, to the temperature. The temperature is listed both on this and this, but this point right here is the dew point. of the air. Let me see, what are we at? We're number four, dew point of the air. This is a very big deal because this is where water changes state from a gas to a liquid. If we are below the dew point, the water is going to just keep condensing on that surface, and actually until the surface finally warms up, but that's how air conditioners work. They have a cold surface and they, the water condenses, takes it out of the air. If it's above this point, water will never condense on that surface. So what do we get for dew point here? If you're following along 25 and 30, 25, 30, it looks like I'm getting about six, seven maybe. Six or seven degrees, is that if we go straight across here? 25, no, maybe, maybe seven degrees. Nope, six. Anyway, let's, let's call this six degrees C for our example. What if we take a can of soda or, or beer out of the fridge and let it sit in this room What's the temperature of a refrigerator? Three, two, three, four degrees C. Water's going to condense on it because it's below the dew point of the air. And after a few minutes, it warms up and that water evaporates again and there's no water con condensing on it. That's the concept of dew point of the air. You get up in the morning of a cold winter night and water's condensing on your windows. 
That's because the window temperature is below the dew point of the air. So you get condensation on it. In the case of leaves, they can get, they can cool at night below the dew point and water condenses on leaves. That's bad news because bacteria go wild when there's water condensed on leaves. So our models make all these measurements, calculate dew point and particularly the dew point of the leaves. And if water's condensing, we send a red alert to the plant pathologists and people and they, they have disease forecasts based on the number of hours below the dew point of the air. But it's based on other measurements in a calculated dew point. So, I'm going to come back to the value of each of these parameters in a minute. But first, I promise five things. The fifth one is shown here. There's no tick marks on this. See these lines go in the opposite direction of everything? This we can go right up here. Relative humidity is two. We go right up here. And this temperature is the wet bulb temperature. Right there. And it, it, these all go both ways. These are all, if you know this, you go this way. These are all double-ended arrows. So what good is the wet bulb temperature? What does that mean? This means the temperature that a wet surface would get to in these conditions. If it's, if it's a wet dish rag, fully wet, how, and it's evaporating like crazy, how cold would it get? So let's see if we can calculate wet bulb from this. 25 up to 30. Now we go this way. And it looks like the wet bulb temperature is about 13.5. So in these conditions, 13.5 C. What this means is a, a wet dish rag would cool to 13.5 C. And as long as it stayed wet, it would stay at this temperature well irrigated leaves could get to this temperature too. If they act like a wet dish rag, they could cool to this. And look at the air temperature is 25 and a wet surface would cool to roughly 13. That's a lot of cooling, but it's low humidity. Now you can quickly run the model and say, oh, what would it be if it was 80% humidity? And all we have to do is go up to 80 up here, and now the wet bulb temperature is something like 22. I mean, it's much closer to air temperature. And the dew point, something like 21, if, the, if, the, if we move in up here in this humidity line. So the absolute humidity is a function of both relative humidity and temperature. Now what we want to calculate is not just absolute humidity, but this driving gradient. And the driving gradient is, let me draw this right here in green. This is a picture of one stomate, a giant stomate, on the bottom of a leaf. Remember we drew this the other day, we had various cells out here. And here's the whole leaf with all the cells. Now there's two cells right here that are called guard cells and they're just exactly like a port with ships going in and out and these guard cells are always going back and forth to restrict the size of this opening. But the driving gradient for humidity, I'm going to put H for, I, I could say AH, let me say AH, absolute humidity I, inside the leaf to absolute humidity in the air. This one is not difficult to get. We put our instruments on it, 
and usually we're getting relative humidity and temperature going this way and, and inside the data logger and we're calculating this absolute humidity. So we know this one. How do we get humidity inside the leaf? We know that any leaf that is not wilted, that is hydrated, is 100% relative humidity. It might be 99%, but it's very close to 100. So now, if we know leaf temperature, and for this example, let's say that the leaf temperature, the air is 25, we just did that, now let's say the leaf is 25. These happen to be at the exact same temperature in this example. Now we can go from air temperature here straight up to 100% humidity. Just it's a, the leaf's the same temperature, so our leaf right here, L-E-A-F, is right there. Now we go from the leaf over here and we get a number for the absolute humidity, the water vapor density inside that leaf. And let's see if we can do that in this example. 25 I'm right, well I'm right here. I can take the tick mark right off of this. It's the same tick mark. I go over here straight across and I'm getting 24.2 maybe. If the leaf is 100% humidity, this line right here is 100% humidity. So we're getting 24.2 inside the leaf. So now we have, get rid of our 100%, 24.2, and the air is 7.5. This driving gradient is 24.2 minus 7.5 with units of grams per kilogram. So uh, whatever this subtraction is exactly, what is that, 16 or something, 17? about 17 um, grams per kilogram. That is the absolute in of humidity inside the leaf minus the absolute humidity air. That's the driving gradient for transpiration. Now what if the leaf starts to run out of water? Just a little bit. It's not as well hydrated. It can't keep up. This, it, it, it can't balance the energy by evaporating water. The leaf gets hotter. Let's say the leaf gets three degrees hotter than the air. It's not wilted yet, it's just, it's just not, the stomates are starting to close. Now we can do 25, 26, 27, 28 degrees C. Still 100% humidity, now we're at 29 inside the leaf if it hot, heats up. So hot leaf, not hot, warm leaf. 29 minus, and the air is still the same, 29 minus 7.5. So as soon as the leaf gets hotter, the driving gradient gets bigger. Now it is possible for really wet leaves to get below air temperature because of that wet bulb. They might get all the way down to the wet bulb, um, but even there, there's a gradient for transpiration. But this gradient for transpiration, and I'm going to show this in red, is always this difference right here between 100% humidity in the leaf and wherever our point is here in the air. There's plenty of computer programs to put stuff in and calculate this stuff. Free programs, psychometric programs, you used to have to pay for them and now they're free on the internet. But none of those, you can use those all day long and you don't see the graphical principles the way you get them with a psychometric chart. It's once you see the chart, you can understand how these points move to make this absolute humidity change. Leaf cooling, 
air humidity, temperature changing. Here's the reason that absolute humidity is such a big deal. If I asked, we put a dish rag outside, when would that, would that dish rag dry faster at 30 degrees C and 80% humidity or at 5 degrees C and 20% humidity? Now most people would say, well, 20% humidity, of course it's going to dry faster. Let's take a look. 5 degrees C, 20%, there's our delta humidity. 30 degrees C, 25, we're off chart, 80%, we're over here, there's, it's a bigger gradient for drying at a warm temperature and 80% humidity than it is down here at a low humidity and cold temperatures. So this is real counterintuitive because you got to think of the combination of air temperature and humidity when we do absolute humidity. But this, these principles, psychometric principles, have been around for 100 years. And this chart's been around for um, a long time. And I worry that we're losing some of the intuitive insights you can get from this chart. By once you have it and you see points on this, you can see them. To, this is real simple, but to reiterate what I just said, here's another handout that shows these points, and two handouts. Um, this is just what I wrote on the board with some formal definitions of these things and then a little diagram showing them. So when you get to teaching this to other people, you can show them this page. And then, to further make sure you have it, I did three worked out examples where you have a couple different inputs and you can calculate the other parameters. Sometimes, you know, like I said, sometimes you know one, sometimes you know another. So, how have we measured this th through the ages? Well, before we had computers and electronic sensors, we had psychrometers. And this is a, you still can buy these. It's a wet dry bulb psychrometer. And it doesn't take electricity. It doesn't take a fast microprocessor. It is two thermometers, one with a wet shoelace over it, and one with nothing. And so nothing is dry bulb. That's where the word bulb comes from. It's the bulb of a thermometer, a mercury or an alcohol thermometer. It just means air temperature. And the wet bulb means one that has a wick. So, the difference in temperature, now we get two numbers, and from this instrument we can calculate everything. No computer, just one piece of paper and this, and we get the temperature, we get the temperature and humidity. Now, there's one key thing about this. You can see it pulls apart. To get the accurate wet bulb temperature, you have to have a fan blowing on it. And fans take electricity, and we don't really want that, so we do this, and these are called sling psychrometers. And I used to pe see people with these in their back pocket, just like the people had carried around slide rules. And they would whip this thing around and they'd aspirate it. And now let's see what we got here. You can tell me the humidity of the room. See if I can read this. So the 77, oh my, this is in Fahrenheit, but 77 is 25 C. So the, air, the dry bulb's 25 and the wet bulb is 59, which is uh, uh, 15 Celsius. So 20, find 25 and wet bulb of 15 and tell me the humidity of this room from your chart. We guessed 30, we'll see how, how close we are. 37, okay. So again, that's these two these two lines here intersecting, and then the, then the 
curve. Because this whole thing is nonlinear, and because this is all in the days before computers, this has a little slide rule on it, tick marks. And you can line up the wet and dry bulb, and it will tell you the humidity right on this. In case you don't have a chart, you just do this. And these tick marks are nonlinear because the relationships are nonlinear. So this is a self-contained instrument to uh, do humidity. And they come, boy, you can get them big if you need precision work. When I was in beginning in graduate school, there were no good electronic humidity sensors. We would take thermocouples and we'd put a shoelace on one and a fan, and we got wet bulb and dry bulb, and that's how we did humidity. That was a state-of-the-art measurement. Then the wet bulb would get dirty, and you had to clean it, and it was complicated. But, but that's how we did humidity. So being a collector of old instruments, I've collected instruments to do this over the years. And here's one of my beauties. Maybe I should put this in the case here downstairs. Big reservoir, a wet wick, and a dry wick, and a nonlinear slide rule to get humidity from the relationships. You can just slide the points around to get humidity if you don't have a computer handy to do it. Um, then in, in instructions on the back for how to owner's manual for how to use that instrument. Then people got better and we had bimetallic strips for humidity and temperature. Here's one with humidity and temperature and the lines cross. And this is a little tiny miniature psychometric chart with the needles are crossing and you can get absolute humidity just from this. So it's a lot of clever things that people did in the days before uh, before we had computers. And of course now slide rules are a completely lost art, but you can still buy a psychometric slide rule where you get wet and dry bulb and you put it in here and calculate the other humidity param parameters and calculate relative humidity from wet and dry bulb. Um, and this is interesting because in the days before computers, that's a linear, kind of long, you could get a circular slide rule. And it's the same thing. Line these two points up and line the tick mark to get humidity. And this you could carry in your back pocket for checking humidity anywhere. So I, these are all fascinating instruments based on the human ingenuity in the days before computers, how they dealt with nonlinear stuff like this chart. I think that's the end of my instrument demo on this. Now, let's start putting numbers in this. Once we get this, let's see if we can put numbers in this to get this, because if we can do this, we don't have to get it by subtraction, because we've shown with instruments we can do a pretty good job of measuring this. The key for this is, this is leaf, absolute humidity, and air. We, to be accurate about this, we need to know the leaf temperature. Yep. If you do air temperature 100% minus air, you can have significant errors in this, depending on the conditions. So we do need to have leaf temperature in this. But once we get this, then we have a very accurate measurement of this driving gradient. Then the rest of it is getting the resistance. Let's see. Ah. I'm going to come back to this in a, in a second here. Let me erase all of this. Because this, by the way, you can buy these specialized for really cold temperatures, and then combustion engineers buy them for really hot temperatures for like smokestacks. They're way out here, but this is the one for 
environmental engineers, which were dealing with environmental temperatures. So this is a classic thing, a ratio of driving gradient and resistance. And we've got to have the units line up in this thing if this is going to be a flux. An amount per unit area per unit time. This one has units, grams per kilogram. But it turns out, every time you work this, you also have to have a correction for air pressure because that changes the driving gradient. So what we do, this is mm, last 20 years, is calculate a dimensionless driving gradient. So we would like to get this in a dimensionless term that, that we can use to put the numbers in this. And to do that, we have this gradient right here in, expressed in W, water, vapor, pressure. And the amount of water in the air creates a vapor pressure. So, and, and we know that from PV, from beginning chemistry, if we know the number of molecules in the air, it's directly proportional to those pressure of those molecules in the air. So when you see people talking about humidity, you do not hear them talking about, oh, there was grams per kilogram in the air we talk about vapor pressure of the water in the air. And this is a direct relationship between number of molecules or weight and the pressure. And the pressure in SI units is kilopascals. So what we would like to do is know the absolute humidity expressed with units of vapor pressure. And that's why two things on this. I think we can see them here. Over here, in addition to grams per kilogram, which is intuitive, is vapor pressure. And that goes from zero, and this chart's three and a half, four, and this has units of kilopascals. So a vapor pressure difference would be the top number minus the bottom number. That's the amount of water in the air expressed as a vapor pressure. So with that, we can take this curve right here, which is this same curve, only all it has on here is vapor pressure. And now this thing goes up to 50 degrees. So you can, you can calculate at some very hot temperatures, really nonlinear. Here's the equation to get this curve. So we do this all in a computer. And here is a table of values. So we can do it by hand, examples looking stuff up here. And we'll convert our absolute humidity in grams per kilogram to vapor pressure. So we get, I'm going I'm to estimate this. Well, we don't even have to estimate. We can do it pretty fast. 25, 30 right here. I go across, I'm getting about one kilopascal. That's the vapor pressure in this room. Now we go up here, 25, cross, and I get 3 point, uh, one, two, 3 point one. Uh, 3 point two. 3 point two minus one. So now converting units, we have 3 point two minus one and now the units are kilopascals. Now I didn't teach this right in the beginning because a vapor pressure is not intuitive. Um, a weight per volume is intuitive, but this converts to pascals. And here's the beauty of this. Water vapor pressure, our delta H in our example, is 2.2 kilopascals. 
Now, we would like to get a dimensionless ratio that we can use at all elevations and, and all pressures, same thing. So we ratio the pressure of the water in the air to the total air pressure. We divide it by the total total air pressure. And at our elevation, our average air pressure, 2.2 divided by 86 kPa. This varies a little bit. High pressure and low pressure it might go from 85 to 87. It doesn't vary very much. Top of Mount Logan, I think it might be 60 kPa. It varies a lot with elevation, but high and low pressure fronts don't change it very much. So this is, somebody's going to have to do this math for me, but it's, what is it going to be? Maybe 2.8? 2.2 divided by 86? Sorry, 0. 0. There we go. 0. 0.25, 0. 0.0256. Now this doesn't have units, this is a dimensionless ratio. KPA to KPA. That's the driving gradient for photosynthesis regardless of elevation because we've divided out by temperature. Now if we got this same gradient, there's an important point for living at elevation. What if we took these measurements and we would made them right out there at the top of Mount Logan and we got 2.2 kPa. We did all our careful measurements, and now we are at 60 kPa. What's that come out to be? 0.036. Which place has faster transpiration rates? Here, everything's the same. Right here, point. 0 0.025, 0 0.036, transpiration is going to be significantly faster at the top of Mount Logan than it is here in Logan for the exact same conditions. If we do this at sea level, it goes the other direction. 2.2, and now sea level is 101 kPa average. So this is by 0 0.022. So Transpiration is less at sea level than here. And this makes sense because water boils at lower temperatures as you get a higher elevation. And so transpiration goes faster at lower pressures too. So this is our dimensionless driving gradient. Now the units for resistance are going to be the same as the or one over the units for flux. But when we express this now in all the models, we don't use resistance anymore, even though I teach it that way because it's a nice ratio. Um, we use conductance, which in electric terms, it's just one over the resistance. So the equations you see for driving gradient for transpiration are transpiration equals delta H it is a dimensionless ratio times G sub S. G, the lowercase g stands for it's the model conductance and the S is to model. So if this is dimensionless, the units for conductance are exactly the same as the units for transpiration. So this might be grams per meter squared per second, and this is just dimensionless, times, in this case, grams per meter per second, a unit for conductance. Now we'll talk about, we're going to have to put, well, we'll talk about conductance in a minute. But the key here is calculating this dimensionless number for uh, transpiration. And I'll, I'll give you a, a I can give you a worked out handout of this, but I have a handout of typical values of these, which helps, because obviously if this ratio goes up 
and the stomates don't change, transpiration goes up 10%. And this we can measure with instruments. This is real hard to measure. And, um, but at least we get this and we can start to estimate transpiration because all it is is two numbers multiplied together. What I have, oh, so before I leave this, yes, here's the whole thing in saturation, vapor pressure, and if you know this curve and you know humidity and temperature, you, you don't have to do all these lines. This leads to equation to do it in a computer, in a spreadsheet. And our data loggers are pre-programmed to do all this stuff in them based on the endpoints because of these relationships. But that's why we, we can do it all from that saturation vapor pressure curve. I have this table here. of typical values, flux, driving gradient, conductance, I could line this up, I hear better. HI inside the leaf, HA air, just to model conductance. Here's some typical transpiration rates. Now, transpiration is determined not by the weight of the water, but by the number of molecules, so we go with moles of water vapor rather than grams or milligrams. But these are typical rates for a typical well-watered leaf in three different units, and then a range for those units. Driving gradients, we got two, and this here's typical, and we calculated 0.0256. So there's our typical gradient, and there's a range. Um, if this was zero, it would mean 100% humidity. Um, but they can get, this gradient can get enormous sometimes, really hot, dry air. And here's units, typical units for stomatal conductance on the, on the bottom. So, so far, this whole thing is great. Even if we can nail this number, we can't get transpiration until we have a sense of this. So you can do two things. You can put in some typical values for this and calculate this, which is okay. This, by the way, is all for a single leaf. It's not for a community of leaves. It's exactly the same principles, but it's a, the driving gradient is, is the average for all the leaves in the community. They might be at different temperatures, but we average those temperatures. Um, and this GS is typically for a single leaf, but we can also calculate conductance for multiple layers of leaves too. That's the difference for a canopy. Um, this doesn't change, but, but this one does. So let me say a bit about stomatal conductance. This gets more, a bit more squishy and I need some room to show this. Um, put this right here. Here's our stomates. A couple of basic principles. Here's G sub S for stomates. So let's put zero here for closed, completely closed. And if we're going off of typical numbers, this can almost get to one, and when it's one, the units are moles per meter squared per second. M moles of, of water vapor per meter squared per second. This unit does not have any physical meaning. It's just a number to make the units cancel in this whole thing, but the driving gradient does. And if this is absolute humidity here, what happens to stomates? So now we're going to go from, as long as we're going from zero, zero would be no air at all in the air. This, this, uh, and I'm going to just put over here, I'm just going to put dry. Humid. 
and dry air. That's, that's good enough for the principle. Stomatal conductance. What does this look like? Well, the driving gradient changes a lot, but do the snowmates change as it gets more humid? It turns out they do. And as air gets more dry, stomates close. Now, if I have zero here, that probably is about right. I mean, if it's super dry, stomates are not constant. This is why this is so complicated, because even if we get this driving gradient right, dang, the stomates keep changing because they're responding to humidity. After decades of research, and part of it's by Keith Mott, my colleague at the university, that's his whole research, is understanding what affects these stomates. If it's dry air, I'm going to erase my numbers here, these stomates dry up and they shrink, and they effect effectively get farther Nope, sorry, the other way around. If it's dry air, they protect the inside. And they start to close so that to keep this humid in here. It has to be humid so the plant can grow. Otherwise it desiccates and it dies. So now the humidity gets higher and they open up more. Because there's not such a gradient, it's easier to keep this hold. We do not understand exactly what these stomates perceive in here, but humidity is a big deal. And they open and close to keep the leaf hydrated. One of the classic things you see is, this is summer, lots of people are growing zucchini and squash. It's common to see a squash plant around here in the middle of the day wilt. If you see them in your garden, if you've ever done that, and you go, dang it, my squash is melted. And you water it again, it still wilts. That process is called physiological drought. And it means that the squash keeps its stomate so open, the xylem can't keep up. It can't get water to the leaves fast enough and it wilts in the middle of the day. And when it wilts, it's, it's, then these close. And then it gets some more water and they open, but Squash op is, it overdoes it, doesn't close its stomates fast enough to stay hydrated. And most plants are very carefully regulating this. So there's a basic relationship between humidity, and this is really this delta, this, I should really say driving gradient here, and uh, stomates. Stomates close at night. Great, it conserves water. They, they need to get CO2 in to, uh, for photosynthesis, but there's no photosynthesis at night, they close. So we also know, if we did, let's see if I can draw another, if we also did CO2 concentration on this same graph and stomatal conductance, and now this is CO2 inside the leaf as the CO2, this is uh, high CO2 and this is low CO2. As the CO2 gets low, the stomates open to let more in and if you give them more CO2, they start to close. So we know this from when we enrich plants with CO2, they grow faster and the stomates close. Why would they lose water? They've got plenty of CO2. They start to close their stomates. So CO2 affects this as well. Um, this mostly is determined by photosynthesis. If the photosynthesis gets faster because of that CO2, then it drives it over here and you've got to have open stomates to get fast photosynthesis. It's like breathing to get the CO2 in. And so the, at night, photosynthesis stops, and they close their stomates. In the day, the higher the sun, they're trying to get the stomates open to get more CO2 so they can grow faster as long as they can keep up with the water to come into the top of the plant. So in a nutshell, and I'm going to close here, 
This is why direct measurements of transpiration are so difficult. It's, even though we can get driving gradient, we've always got to be estimating this resistance. And these estimates are, you can make nice measurements in the lab. How do you measure resistance for stomates? Years ago, we used to take microscopes and look at the size of the stomates. Oh, they're more open here, measure that one. We don't do that anymore. How do we do it now? We measure this, and then we measure this, and we calculate that. That's the remaining thing. So we've done this thousands of times, rearranged this equation to get resistance, and then we start to make drive principles like this for what the stomates do. And after we get those principles, what environmental conditions affect the stomates, then we take them to the field and try and predict whole canopies from it. But it's difficult to do. The beauty of it is driving gradients are not difficult, and we know they're related to those, and those we can measure and calculate based on psychometric principles. So, any questions? This is the end of the transpiration part of this. If I could find an outline here. Um, I just blew through this whole works right here in transpiration. Tomorrow, lecture six, we'll talk about conduction and convection, which is the same flux as driving gradient over resistance. That goes pretty fast because um, it's the same equation now we have we can really nail this because guess what this the resistance here is not involved biology it just involves wind blowing and cooling things and those are physical principles so here we can nail heat transfer by conduction and convection because there's no biology squishy biology of the stomates opening and closing so now we can get this and then again by subtraction we can get transpiration. So we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock. <laughs>